and he's like progressively getting more and more angry and he's like that was so disrespectful that shows me your character that you're not a responsible person that you're not going to take care of my daughter i don't like Whoa. this i don't like you for my family and my family this is unacceptable he pulled over he said get out of my car and he kicked me out of his car and he left me on the side of the highway and he drove off. I'm Louis Cole. Welcome to the Recharged Podcast. In this series, I invite fellow content creators and artists to explore exciting ways to make a difference in the world. I take my guests to visit local social good projects in my self-converted electric 1973 Volkswagen van. We have real and raw conversations about life and hear from social good heroes that we can all be inspired by. On today's podcast, our guest is Jason Y. Lee, an accomplished producer and director, successful entrepreneur, and founder of Jubilee Media, a digital agency, social enterprise, and movement of young changemakers, which now has a social following of over 8 million. Jubilee's tagline is feel more, think more, see more in others. Their goal is creating a movement of empathy and connection. Jason believes we are all intrinsically linked and want to live for something deeper. Living for empathy and human good is a resilient vision and one that is worthy of pursuit. So today's guest is Jason, and I'm just so excited to have you, Thank you on the likewise. podcast, bro. I'm, I'm so happy to not only see you, because it's been ages, it feels it like, been a while. COVID, but also to see this beauty, yeah. which I've been watching your journey, and dude, I'm just in awe that we're in a moving vehicle that you essentially built. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel. I mean, technically <laughs> I didn't build it, but it feels like I built it, which I, is exciting. Hey, I like barely know how to change my oil, so I, I feel like you're like leaps and bounds ahead of me. <laughs> uh, but kudos. Yeah. And I think it's fun, like it's a bit of a gimmick for the podcast, having it set in here. But um, I think it's fun to like show people like a retro vehicle that's been kind of upcycle to be have like a modern powering system you know yeah and we get to like see the world and, and travel together yeah literally so that's good so to kick off what i've been doing is just asking guests to do like a three minute life story okay just to just to start us off that sounds good yeah. um so my name is jason wiley i'm the founder the ceo of jubilee media my story kind of begins in Kansas. Uh, I was raised in Kansas, but my parents are uh, professors, which is why we ended up there. Uh, but my entire life, I was kind of like followed the rules. I like, you know, the dream was study hard, get into a good college, get a good job, you know, have a successful career, like have family, retire, that's happiness. And that's kind of like the journey I went on for like the first 21 years of my life. I ended up going to Penn, studying business at Wharton, uh, graduated, went to go work at a consulting firm called Bain in New York. And I was like, I've made it. This is the dream. And as I was looking around, I, rec I realized, wait a second. It wasn't that I was unhappy. I wasn't like completely fulfilled. It wasn't, I, I didn't feel the happiness that I thought. And I was around then that I started to realize, wait a second. What if I'm supposed to do something completely different with my life? What if I were not afraid? What is it that I would be doing? And it was around then that I actually start, first started making YouTube videos. Um, and my first video was because of the Haiti earthquake to raise money. So I went, raised money, made a video about it, you know, 10,000 views, raised thousands of dollars. And I was like, oh, I went viral. And then that became my journey of like making short stories, short videos on YouTube for a good cause. I, I eventually started a nonprofit called the Jubilee Project. And then in 2017, I launched Jubilee Media. And our whole purpose is that we want to create a media company that really kind of bridges people together and really inspires empathy in a time that we feel like we are so divided and that people don't really take time to listen to each other and understand each other. So that's my story. So that's just, yeah, it's great to hear kind of the journey to, that you've taken to get here. Because I think a lot of people probably can relate to like being on that certain path and then having almost like kind of a moment of clarity or epiphany or something and scary right yeah um it's like, like my entire life is a lie no <laughs> i know i know I mean, I mean there's so many questions i guess first of all i want to say like i've been so inspired just watching the content you guys have been working on for years oh thank you and Likewise. so like yeah just so intrigued because you tackle really 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 tough topics in such a accessible way. And I feel like that's 
like not many people are able to do that. I think so many people uh, are scared and shy away from talking about important issues happening in the world. I mean, even in the last few weeks with Israel, Palestine, like so many creators I know are like, I don't want to say anything in case I'm being accused of, of course. taking a side. And yeah. I remember um, a couple of years back, like you did the, the middle ground episode with Israel and Palestine. And it's just yeah. like so interesting to hear people sit down, talk about their points of view, talk about kind of the hurt and the anger and the, it's just, yeah, I just love that you've created a platform that gives, like helps people tell their stories and doesn't shy away from anything, you know? No, I appreciate that. You know, I wish I could say that, like that all emanated just from my soul, but I think in a lot of ways, what I've learned is that people desperately want to hear different perspectives and actually want to see ourselves in other people. Uh, and the truth is that it can be difficult because it's scary because we don't actually know, you know, we're not all the same and therefore we all have very different experiences and we all have very different points of view. Uh, but one thing that I think we've really seen with Jubilee Media is that people are interested in that conversation yeah. and want to understand the differences. And even though we don't always agree that there's a lot of middle ground there. Mm -hmm. So I've just been super inspired to make the content. It's awesome seeing people respond to it and they encourage us because they're like, hey, you should do an episode on this. Or we see other people who are wanting to share their experiences. So in a lot of ways, we just get to be a mirror to this next generation that is so insightful and so empathetic and so meaningful. And also, we've been such a big fan of yours, by the way. Oh, thank I feel you. Like, <laughs> I remember when I first met you, I was like, oh my God, this is the guy. It's like Louis invented daily vlogging, you know? And it was like, so, such a creator at your soul. So, uh, I mean, I feel like this ecosystem has just been so encouraging to us. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just, YouTube has been, I guess, something that's changed both of our lives. Oh, absolutely. What, um, what do you think gave you the courage to kind of leave your job and kind of break out of this expectation to be traditionally successful or whatever, especially coming from, like you, both your parents are South Korean, right? Yep, um, immigrants. They yeah. like first generation immigrants. They immigrated, yep, exactly. And from what I understand, there's an even add, like a higher added pressure and expectation in that culture. Yeah. So I think I watched one of the interviews you had and it was like, having to break that news to your mom was like, oh, it was so big for her and like, dramatic. Yeah. what? <laughs> I'm just so intrigued to with with such knowing there'd be such a kind of backlash or n not an immediate acceptance. What was it that was like really driving you to be like, no, I still need to do this? Yeah, I mean the thing about immigrants, you know, my parents were immigrants from Korea. They immigrated to America maybe 1985, mm -hmm. and for them the journey was like so perilous, right? They had no money. And they were like, how we have a dream and we believe that America is going to be this great place for not only ourselves, but our kids one day. Um, but they had to struggle so much to get to where they are. And that's why they have very much this mindset as they were growing up here, or uh, not growing up, as they were making a life here of, oh, it seems like the stable jobs are in, you know, law or being a doctor or or being an engineer. These are jobs that will always be there. And that's why I think that they pushed me and my brother into those spaces because they thought, oh, surely if they're in this space, it's gonna be less struggle. And that's what we want from our, for our kids. And it's interesting because they came here for a dream and in a lot of ways, they're like forcing us into their dream of what we should do now. But in a lot of ways, I never really asked myself what my dream was. Yeah. But um, I think what, what really helped me, you know, I'm sure you get this all the time. We get, we get asked sometimes to speak at different events, right? And speak at colleges, the young people. And I remember hearing a speaker that went right before me and she was talking about a palliative care nurse named Bronnie, Bonnie Ware. Um, are you, like a palliative care nurse is like a type of nurse that is like helping folks who are gonna pass away soon actually. So helping their kind of like w their transition. Yeah. And for all these folks who are about to die, she would ask them a really important question. She said, what is your biggest regret in your life? And you know, if folks would say, you know, I wish I had traveled more, or I wish I spent more time with my family. But the majority of the people who are about to die would say, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself and not one that others expected of me. And when I heard that, I like literally just 
felt like it cut me to the heart because it felt like that was speaking exactly to me. That I had been someone who had listened to what my parents had told me and what society had told me was successful. And I never asked myself, if I were not afraid, if I were really to listen to who I am supposed to be, how would I live my life? And that didn't get me from zero to the top of Mount Everest, but it did encourage me to take that very first step to make that very first video. You know, and even so, it's like this very long, I don't want people to listen to this and be like, oh, now I gotta quit my job because it's not that easy. Yeah. But it kind of helped me to like explore different things and say yes more and start to find what it is that I was really excited to do. I relate slightly to this kind of having this job career path set for you that's like wow this would be this would be great you know I'd I can see a path of achieving that that um, kind of society's model of success like yeah. you know money security um, maybe it's kind of having that uh, admiration of yeah of course re, you know being respected yeah, respect. by your peers yeah and course. I remember it's not quite the same but I remember leaving a full-time job in my early 20s because what I found was I was every day looking forward to going home to do volunteer youth work yes so much more than going to work to the point where I was like I think this might be you know I think this might be what I'm what I'm more passionate about and then it became the point where it was like do I, would I sacrifice the security, the money, the respect yes. to chase that dream? Yeah. And it got to the point where I would. I was like, actually, I'm willing to kind of go through that challenge of, oh, maybe I'll lose, you know, not have any money and, and have to figure it out. I think that's exactly the right question. And sometimes we get it twisted where we think, oh, if I find my passion that I'm gonna get rich doing mm. it, I'm gonna be so successful and get all this acclaim, which is all possible. But the better question is, what are you willing to do to make this your profession yeah. or your vocation or to make it sustaining, sustaining for you, right? And a lot of times that journey is not sexy. You know, I, I, I know you've had this in your journey, but I've had a time in my life where I was making zero money. Uh, I was living, you know, in a friend's extra bedroom yeah. on a bunk bed, not knowing, you know, how am I gonna like, eat let alone save money for retirement or buy a car all these things but um, I think it's a really important question that sometimes we try to ignore but if we have the privilege and I actually think it is a privilege to be able to ask ourselves that question because not everyone is frankly in this position to be able to do so but if you're able to it's, it's a really worthwhile question to consider I am um, one of the other I think maybe it was like your TEDx talk or something I was watching and you talked about your reaction to the Haiti earthquake and wanting to do something. Um, and there's a quote you used around like you believing that even an ordinary person can do something extraordinary. Yes. Yeah. Where did that where did that belief come from? Was that from like your upbringing? Was that from your faith? Like I'm just interested because I think a lot of people don't believe that. Yeah. It's funny because there have been so many instances in my life where I've just learned that to be true. Yeah. And now I say it because I truly believe it, but there were times in my life I said it, I didn't believe it. The first time I actually heard it was from uh, Steve Jobs when he said, you oh, know, okay. you may as well try to do something extraordinary because there are people far more ordinary or far less equipped than you who are doing, frankly, extraordinary things because they have the courage to try to do so, right? But um, one of my favorite stories to tell is um, when I was in high school, my parent, my mom is a, she's a computer science professor. So she was like, Jason, you need to learn how to code. The future is in coding. I said, okay. So I thought she was going to teach me. She said, no, I'm, I'm too busy, but why don't we get one of your brother's friends who like loves computers to teach you how to code? So I said, okay, that'd be cool. So once a week, um, he would come over and when, like we built our first like HTML website. I learned how to code and I found very quickly that I didn't have a uh, talent for this thing. Uh, but this friend did. Um, he ended up graduating. Um, really bright guy, but you know, you would never, not to put him down, he, he was really bright, but it was not like, oh, this guy is special and he's different. He tried really, really hard in high school. He ended up going to MIT, which was amazing. And it was like this amazing gift. And as while well, he was at MIT, 
uh, his junior year, he actually sent a bunch of his friends an email, which was like, hey, I'm thinking about dropping out before my senior year because I want to create this startup. And I remember my, my brother responded saying, you know, you only have like a, less than a year left. Why would you drop out? You might as well get your degree. And he said, you know what? I'm going to do it anyways. He drops out. Literally six months later, we all get an invite to beta test what he's calling the Dropbox. So this guy that, you know, we grew up with, I knew him from debate, I knew him from high school, ended up founding a billion dollar company in the Dropbox. Wow. And, you know, I love Arash, but he is not, he is an ordinary guy who's done something extraordinary. And I think what's extraordinary about him was kind of the courage that he had to do it, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So there's so many instances of, of that in my life where I see people just take that leap of faith and be rewarded that I'm like, surely, why not me? Why not us? You know? Yeah. Um, so I think that that really kind of instilled that in me. Yeah. No, I think having that belief that if we can step out of faith and have courage to do something that might be uncomfortable or might set us down a, a path that doesn't that's unknown or scary you know I think a big theme we've been talking about in these podcasts is like how most people are limited because of their fear yeah. um, and, and the fear of failure specifically of course, yeah. this is a kind of interesting question I've got for you but where what would you say has been your biggest failure in life and how have you navigated through that or overcome that you know, it's funny because the biggest fears that I always have revolve around people's perception of me. I'm more worried that people will think that I am a failure than of being a failure. Um, and I think something that I learned along my journey is actually whenever you feel fear, sometimes the fear is important, right? If you're afraid of a bear because you see a bear, like yeah. sometimes you should... Or the edge of a cliff right. or sticking you your should. hand in fire. Like there's, These a are important there's a natural cues. important. But when it comes to like our livelihood and like our purpose, I actually find that like sometimes you're supposed to run towards fear actually mm. rather than running away from fear because they're a good indicator for the things that maybe you're most afraid of trying because you're most afraid of maybe failing but also that this might be what you're supposed to succeed in um, but as far as my failure man I've got so many um, <laughs> it can be an uncomfortable thing to talk about because I think in culture we are told like not to yes. highlight failure but I think if you look at anyone that's kind of even traditionally succeeded yes they almost see the failure as like oh this is an important part of the journey so critical you know, for me, the thing that comes to mind is there was a time between Jubilee Project and There's Jubilee Media. Oh, well. thank you. There was a time between Jubilee Media and Jubilee, or Jubilee Project and Jubilee Media where um, at the time people were really celebrating us and saying, oh man, you, we had just hit maybe 300,000 subscribers, which was like a big goal for us. Um, we had made a video that got like over 20 million views on YouTube. And so people were saying, oh man, you're doing it. You're really doing it. And it was at that very time, actually, that my older brother, Eddie, and one of my best friends, Eric, who had started Jubilee Project with, actually both ended up leaving. Not because we were having disagreements, but because they kind of felt like there was something else that was their calling. And suddenly, I actually felt like a failure completely. Because so much of my identity was tied, and so much of my courage came from the three of us doing it together. And then suddenly, I felt like, wait a second, I'm like the last guy on a sinking ship. So you felt like it was coming to an end at that point? Oh, absolutely. And I, I didn't know if I had the ability or even the desire to continue on. So for about two years, 2015, 2016, um, I actually was doing a lot of like soul searching, like existential crisis. And that's when I was like, you know what? I don't care about any of the subscribers. I don't care about the viewership. I don't even care about like the numbers. What is it that I'm trying to do and why? And it was only once I hit the rock bottom that I started to recognize, oh, why did I begin this in the first place? And I was out of that kind of darkness and out of that like turmoil that I think I started to clarify a vision now for what Jubilee Media was going to become. If you saw me during that time though, and you said, Jason, how are you doing? I would have said, oh, 
not well. Um, it's, it's something that I, I, I really didn't talk about for a long time because it was such a difficult period in my life, I think, where I felt like I was a failure, that people had left what I was building and that I wasn't a good leader and I, I wasn't really contributing anything. And was it just a gradual, did you gradually kind of work through that or was there like a turning point for you where you felt like you had a breakthrough? It's funny, um, like I'm a person of faith. Um, yeah. And for me, I remember distinctly, I was like praying and being on my knees and being like, what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? And I remember, um, I remember like kind of this moment of like, there is a reason why you are here on this earth. Like you have a purpose here. And it wasn't even like the clarity of like, Jason, this is the vision for you. It was mainly like, your value isn't coming from what you make. Your value is that you are you and you're loved and you're like beloved in that way. And that was like me kind of like making my heart whole first. And it was only then that I was able to actually like fill the heart. Because before that, I think there was just all these cracks and like these ways I was trying to fill myself up from the work that I was doing. And that ended up being like a really important time for me to like love myself, I guess. Yeah, nice. That's. I think it's so true in the, in this, especially in the YouTube social media industry, where like, it you can easily get um, disillusioned with how how your identity is tied into your work or success online. I mean, I guess it can happen in any industry, but Absolutely. there's something particularly where you're like feeding off it's so visible right yeah views and you know subscribership goal and then if you see things slowing down or dropping or views dropping then there's this idea that oh people will perceive that and the comments are brutal sometimes to see that the channel's failing or the videos aren't doing well or um, so I, I totally relate to that I feel a lot of creators I've spoken to have gone through some really intense mental health struggles of like depression or soul searching and trying totally. to figure out like what why are they even doing this you know losing a lot of their original vision behind what it is they want to do with everything you know absolutely and that's um, why burnout is so prevalent right yeah. with creators yeah um do you think do you think it helped bring clarity to what your kind of life mission statement is or what your or even just particularly with jubilee media like did you could you some could you sum up what your goal is with yeah. your life now you know i've always believed like my personal mission is that i want to inspire a generation of change makers generation is a really strong word mm. so even if it's a couple of individuals i will feel <laughs> like i have succeeded but a generation is an aspiration yeah um, and with Jubilee, our vision is that we want to provoke a new culture of empathy. And we use the word provoke in a new culture because in a lot of ways, a lot of people are starting to talk about empathy and say, oh, you know, there's like a version of empathy that's just let's be nice to each other. And yeah. I think, of course, that's important. But I think what's missing is like doing some of the work, like actually listening to perspectives that are different than you. I think empathy, empathy requires a diversity of perspectives and different points of view, but we're not seeing that often in our media, we're not seeing that in our news, and I just feel like there is such a reckoning that will happen because I think young people recognize that just because you wear a red shirt and I wear a blue shirt that we all have to believe one way of thinking, and it just makes no sense, right? Um, so I think that's where we want to be. We want to be not for one party or one political agenda, but really about understanding ourselves and other people better. Yeah. And I think that's what's going to lead to a lot more empathy and hopefully a lot more love and kindness for everyone. Yeah, I think I think it's so true that we, and I don't know whether this is just a perception that we have, that the world is, feels so much more divided than it has previously yeah and maybe there's been times in history that we don't know of or like we weren't around to see it but it does feel like with all the just the media storm and yeah. the Trump presidency and everything it just feels like it's so sad to see 
things crumbling. Yep. And I couldn't agree more with this like desperate need for dialogue and you know I've even felt um, I've even felt like disappointed in myself that I've been triggered in conversations to the point where I don't want to engage and I'm just like I can't I just get angry yeah of course. and then I'm like I'd rather not speak to this person right about this because I feel so angry at their point of view right. at my my perception of their ignorance or whatever and I just feel like the more I've learned about you know, social issues that I I get more riled up when I hear people saying certain things or having certain viewpoints. But I'm kind of like, this is I don't. This is not the reaction I want. I want to be able to have this kind of open open mindedness, this eagerness to find this kind of middle ground. And like, I don't know where to start with that. And if if you got any like. This is almost like advice I'm just asking you. Of like, yeah, totally. Where, how do you react to people that have viewpoints that seem to be, I don't know, not, not just differing from yours, but almost, you know, offensive to your totally. life? Yeah. Well, first off, what I'll say is um, I, think, I think of it as a muscle. And I think it's like, if you haven't worked out a certain muscle, but you first start using it, you're like, wait a second, I can't even do this. But it's something that we have got to be intentional about of hearing different perspectives and how do we respond, right? Um, and I also want to say that there's a difference between different perspectives versus um, prejudice mm. or uh, hatred, right? And the way I always kind of put it to our team is like Jubilee, we want it to be a place where Literally anyone can have a seat at the table. Uh, if we're setting out dinner, that anyone has a seat at the table, but that actually implies that they're ready to sit at the table. Meaning if someone's coming in and they're gonna take a bowl of spaghetti and throw it at my mom and they're gonna take a knife and they're gonna stab me, like then they're no longer welcome, right? Like uh, uh, having a seat at the table kind of necessitates like that there is a mutual understanding of we're going to be listening and having dialogue so sometimes there are some individuals who you want to speak to who are not ready to have that conversation so you can't force them to have dialogue and in the other ways sometimes you're like no I love my table all of my friends are here all the cool kids are here and you're like I don't want that guy who maybe looks different or thinks different or eats something different to sit at my table but if they are actually looking for a place at the table, I think that it's something that we have to like develop that muscle to do. So I think understanding that it's a process and understanding that the last four or five years, we've um, become much worse at that, I think, than better. Mainly because of the political space, but also because of media and our social media echo chambers that we hear often about, right? Like, Yeah, it's got so bad. It, when you think, oh my God, it must, it's like, uh, crazy or idiot like uh, ludicrous that someone might think this way but then you also recognize maybe like half the country feels this way it's like okay something there's a disconnect then yeah. right why is it that we have such different beliefs even when we reside in the same country for example so it's a it's a hard question but so it's something that we kind of think about every day at Jubilee <laughs> I um I recently was having a conversation with, with uh, Ryan, my fiance, and, and uh, it was around fairness versus forgiveness and how often they're kind of opposed to each other. Um, and I fall more on the line of forgiveness and she falls more into like things have to be fair. Justice, yeah. Yeah. And, there's, and it's an interesting conversation because I feel like in some ways we're in a culture right now which is so much about justice that it can become this cancel cancel culture where it's like you know if there's anything you've ever done wrong there's oh, no yeah. there's no kind of uh, there's no forgiveness for it it's just like it, there has to be it has to be fair and you need to pay the, the kind of the penalty for what you did right whereas I feel like we need to find a way to, yes, hold people accountable, especially for like severe stuff, but 
you know, what I've noticed in this culture is so many creators now don't want to speak up about anything because they're worried about saying the wrong thing or they're Absolutely. using the wrong words. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Such that? Such a good question. Because it's kind of paralyzing for It is people. paralyzing. And it's easier to not say anything than to make a mistake, right? Mm. What I hope that's is the safe thing to do, not oh, saying it is, uh, but that's also then in action, right? I, I hope that we're going to start to normalize a behavior where um, actually mistakes are okay mm. and that we recognize that we're not perfect. Imagine, you know, um, who is perfect, right? Like, imagine a world where everyone in the world knew the worst thing you had ever done. If we recognize that we're all imperfect and that we all can be probably canceled for different reasons, then we have a lot more grace in that way. Does that mean that we should continue to let people just make mistakes like willy nilly and take mm. no accountability? No. I actually think that there's a, like a middle ground, which is a space where like maybe you make a mistake, but you're actually able to take accountability, have the conversation to understand why maybe you've made a mistake and be able to say, hey, I was wrong and this is why I'm going to change. Yeah. Right now, that doesn't seem to exist. It's either like you're perfect, which no one is. So, yeah. it make so everyone's basically going to get cancelled at some point because something's going to come out. I think we're going to get to a post-cancel culture I where so. so many people are cancelled that we start to recognize we can't live in this kind of society. Yeah. And let's build a bridge now towards like reconciliation, yeah. like accountability. And we can still see justice and empathy there as well. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's pause that conversation. We've arrived. Um, All right. So basically, this podcast consists of like arriving and having a bit of an interactive experience at an NGO. So uh, we're heading. It. We're heading in now to. Um, it's actually a. It's actually. Infinite Flow, which is this like, dance, uh, dance group. Okay. Yeah. So I, I wasn't going to warn you, but I think this is going to be kind of fun. Today we're visiting Marissa Hamamoto. Marissa is a leader, artist, speaker, and founder of Infinite Flow. Infinite Flow aims to empower people through dance and storytelling. Having survived a stroke, multiple sexual assaults, body shaming, PTSD, and discrimination as an Asian American, Marissa developed deep empathy towards those who are excluded. This eventually led her to start Infinite Flow in 2015, which has become an award-winning Los Angeles-based nonprofit and professional dance company that employs dancers with and without disabilities. Her mission is to use dance as a catalyst to dismantle biases and promote inclusion in greater society. 61 million adults in the United States live with a disability. One in four adults in the United States have some type of disability. These come with various barriers that may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Disability inclusion is still a huge issue that we need to address. Many people experiencing a disability in the United States believe the Americans with Disabilities Act needs a recalibration as it currently only offers minimum support and has barely any official enforcement. Inclusive private organisations and initiatives are also key and Marissa is truly leading the way with what she is modelling with Infinite Flow. Okay. <laughs> I'm very nervous actually. Yeah? Are you? Oh, that's good. Okay, so this is Marissa. You founded an organisation, Infinite Flow. Correct. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us briefly just a bit about what your vision is, what you're doing? And then sure. we can jump in and meet your friends. And sure. Um, so Infinite Flow is a nonprofit based here in Los Angeles. We are a professional dance company composed of dancers with and without disabilities. And our mission is to use dance to promote inclusion and celebrate intersectionality. And these are my actually founding members, Mia Shaikowitz <laughs> and Lourdes. And Lourdes, actually, yeah, they're both founding members. Mia's been part of my, my professional dance company since the beginning. And Lourdes was a youth student, one of my, my, actually my first youth student, and now 19. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's kind of weird that now you're able to like sign your own releases, we can use swear words and we don't get in trouble. So anyway, so, um, but I figured probably the best activity to get to know us to actually dance. Yeah. All right, let's do it. So let's just turn on the music and dance. All right. I'm feeling it. I like it. I'm feeling it. This 
it's like uh, body popping, right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of partner work, and this is like, I mean, wheelchair dance is not the only thing we do at Infinite Flow. Today I have my two wheelchair dancers, but we have dancers who are deaf, blind, uh, with different intellectual disabilities, neurodivergent, neuro, uh, neurodivergent dancers, etc. So we have, so it's a mix of people. But how, how did it all begin? What was your initial like what started this whole journey yes i'm a stroke survivor and i had a stroke when i was in college and that led me to this work the longer story <laughs> which i think we should get after the dancing is, okay yeah we can do yeah that yeah is um it's a lot of it actually has to do with my asian american heritage of feeling like the other like mm. i grew up in very similar to you i kind of i didn't grow up in all like in, in the in um in Kansas. Mm -hmm. I grew up here in Southern California, but I grew up like in a very predominantly white neighborhood. So I was one of the only people of color. And uh, between that and um, there's just been so many instances in my life where I felt like the other, like whether I was the only Asian American or when I went to Japan. And even though I'm Japanese, I'm still not Japanese enough in Japan. Um, and I mean, I can go on and on, but I just I always felt like I never belonged. So in so you a way, wanted to create a space where people felt like they could belong. Yeah, and not just not just this space, but a, like a company that inspires the world to create a culture of belonging is how I would like to kind of describe what we do now. It didn't always start that way. I think it's, at first it was more like, oh my gosh, one in four people have a disability, and you know how many, how much is dance accessible for people with disabilities, right, Lourdes? Yeah, like. It's not. It's not. We, want, we need the problems of social justice to be addressed more, like whether it's around you know, BLM or Stop Asian Hate or anything around LGBTQ. Like we need more people speaking up about the problems in the world, but we also need people to come up with the solutions. And we also need people that give us a vision of where we're going. So I would say where we fall in is like we address the problem, but we also are looking at how can we create this ideal world. So I'll show you a little bit more of our work yeah. on our computer, but let's get dancing. Okay, okay. <laughs> I love it. I love, yeah, I I end love up talking. Okay. okay, so you're ready to go and then step in. Go ahead. And quick, quick, slow. We're dancing. Quick, quick, slow. Say, say the words with me, quick, slow. <laughs> quick, quick, slow. <laughs> I'm a dancer. Yes. yes. I'm wanting to learn more about kind of everything you're doing, your bigger vision for stuff, and maybe your, your guys' experience of like what this has brought for your lives. And yeah. So you were explaining like, and maybe you can dive in a bit deeper, like this whole feeling of wanting to um, model what like an inclusive future could look like, right? Yes, yes. Like, Recently, um, someone asked me this question. I started crying because all I see is like, like a sea of people of all all colors, all races, all ages, all sizes, all abilities, um, all gender identities, sexual orientation. So, like just everyone just dancing together as one. That's like the vision I have. Um, but I just feel like, like even right now, we didn't know each other, but just in a ten-minute dance class, it's like. We're comfortable with each other, and that's and that's that's what that's the magic of dance. It's like yeah. it's like 
we don't have to go through like this two hour conversation on diversity, equity, inclusion. We can connect with people that we don't know through just a five minute dance, 10 minute dance, like, you know, right? Like that, and that's the beauty of dance. And, and whether you're in doing the dance itself or you're watching, like the, there's like this similar effect of feeling like that, oh, oh, like, you know, we, when, every time I show the sizzle reel, like what I get is like, like this sense of like, oh, everyone can dance and therefore I belong too, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> I love that, so beautiful. I think it's something I've been talking to Raya about of like, I've just said to her, like, I want to dance more just for fun because it's so playful. Yeah. And I think it connects us with that inner child that helps us. And maybe that inner child is where we drop our barrier, like our kind of prejudices or things that we've built up and been programmed as an adult. Like yeah. you always go back to that innocence of just like having fun playing, you're not seeing differences with people around you. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Example, I always used to give the, the example, if you go to a wedding, who's the first on the dance floor? It's the kids. Mm. The kids are out there because they don't have that, that. No shame. Yeah, no yeah. they haven't like had this time to, you know, judge themselves on what they're going to look like. And they just are out there to have fun and to feel the music. And that everybody has that inside, you know, and yeah. it is tapping into that inner child. Because we all were that at yeah. one point. It's like, why did that get lost? Let's Actually, the, back. the first video I ever saw of Jubilees was that, I think it's a campaign you were doing, but it was around like, what would you change about your body? Yeah. And you interviewed like adults and they were all like talking about things they were ashamed of or they're too fat or their nose is big. And then it was like the kids' answers to what would you change about your body was, oh, I would have wings. Yeah. Like, I want to be a superhero. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, like, why I have, we have a mermaid tail. Yeah. 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 And yeah. it's just like, that's what we lose. We we lose that kind of that childlike yeah, magic in our lives. I think you're right though, that dance like kind of breaks down those barriers and makes you initially feel like, what if I fail or what if I look stupid? But then as you do that with someone else, you kind of begin to trust them more and you kind of yeah, feel like you know each other and you connect in a way that yeah. you, you're right, that you wouldn't even just for the conversation sometimes. Like, just going back to 20 minutes ago, mm -hmm. what went through your head when you saw me and Lourdes and you have to dance with them? Some kind of like, what am I getting, what am I getting into was probably going in. And even for me, like how, like I'm a stroke survivor and I've gone through tons of discrimination as an Asian American and feeling like the other and all of this stuff. But what ultimately got me to go, okay, I got to take action was I met Adolfo who um, also is a founding member of Infinite Flow, wheelchair user and at, you know, he's an athlete, he's a bodybuilder, just happens to be paralyzed from the waist down from a car accident. Um, uh, no dance experience, but after a couple hours of dancing with him, I realized that dancing with him was nothing different from dancing with anyone else. Mm -hmm. And that was like, ho holy shit, dance doesn't discriminate. Wow. And oh my God, if the world danced, there wouldn't be any war. I know that she laughs when every time I say this, but, <laughs> but that's exactly like, that's, that, was, that, was like my, that was like the moment, my defining moment of like, oh my gosh, I gotta do this. And so, and like, I mean, today too, like it's been, and actually to tell you the truth, out of the pandemic, this was like our first like group gathering. Well, I was gonna ask, like, <laughs> I, uh, have, have any of you seen the show, um, This Is Us? So there's a, I actually cried in one of the recent episodes because she has to shut down her dance studio and it shows you this, sorry if I'm ruining the episode, but it shows you this like the pandemic hitting, um, they were initially doing the classes with masks on, then they went to doing Zoom calls and you saw like a whole class of Zoom calls going down to like five people to two people and then she had to close the whole thing. And I was like, this is reality, this is happening to people and it's like cr for people that had that as their connection to people that's so you know moving your body and specific it's so interesting because it's specifically around dance that's like it must be so hard you can't really do this remotely like you can try like maybe you can get a bit of mo motion but not, know, it's nowhere near the same right this this film right here this is um this is a 47 minute film that we produced called scoops of inclusion and we brought our elementary school assembly program that was in person to a virtual program which became a short film it was shot on green screens. And again, we had people, people on different comfort levels despite all the testing. So some people we shot in their apartments, so we sent them green screens. And so it was like, but anyway, everyone's all interacting with each other in one environment in the film. But oftentimes it's like the scene was shot in like six different places. And so that's how we made shit happen mm -hmm. <laughs> in the pandemic. Yeah, and we made it happen but again, it's nothing like in person. So um, 
I mean, I will say that I did, I mean, and they, they know that we've done everything we can to kind of keep ourselves afloat, but there's nothing more like these situations where you're actually physically in contact with someone. Yeah, especially partner dancing. Because yes. a lot of what we do um, is partner dancing based. Um, with, um, the, with the partners is that we, we're innovative. So we have even experimental days where we're just like, let's see what we can come up with. And, you know, we've come up with a, a really cool amount of tricks, but we try to recreate them um, just by screens, like in different places. Like wow. even some of the dips that I've had with, with one of my dance partners for us, we tried to recreate. And I tried to recreate it by holding onto a doorknob. <laughs> And the yeah. doorknob fell off, and yeah, I fell backwards. And that video it. went viral on TikTok. <laughs> yeah, and it was hilarious. Oh, people were like, "Why would you even be doing that? Like, why would you even be holding? You know?" Yeah. But, but that's that's the point. Is that that that's kind of how we dance, anyways. We try to you know problem solve, and we try to figure out cool and different ways to do it. So we're used to doing that in our everyday lives and in Infinite Flow. That's kind of our mentality. So I think it was a little easier for us to become experimental during the times of mm -hmm. like, all right, what can we do? How Very creative. can we make this work? Well, and I think that's we our did. lives, you know? That's it's, what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Like, I remember when I was in high school, I took a dance class, and I wouldn't have if I hadn't taken uh, classes with Infinite Flow. But the whole time was, how do I do this? How do I take what the teacher's showing the rest of the class, and how do I interpret it? Mm. And... You know, it, it was like that for my whole life. It was like, okay, this route doesn't work to get to class. I'm going to have to go this way. Um, and what's the quickest way to get there? You know, especially with the <laughs> transitions between one class to another. It, it, was, it was tough. Um, but, you know, the whole idea is we've always had to learn how to change things. Um, because the way that you're supposed to do it just doesn't work. Yeah. And when something doesn't work one way, you figure it out until you got it. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and the thing with Infinite Flow is like, you know, you know, me and Lord as I brought, you know, I, I wanted this to be as simple as possible so they have physical disabilities using wheelchairs, but we have individuals who are deaf and blind, neurodivergent. Um, who else do we have? Oh yeah, we have, you know, we have dancers with, with prosthetic limbs and all, you know, and, and it's 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 like and everybody has their story of how they adapt their lives or hack their, I, I don't want to say adapt, hack their lives yeah. <laughs> to make things work. But mm -hmm. it's also very interesting when we bring everyone together and see what's even possible together. And that's that togetherness that I would say that I, you know, I mean, we're pretty singular in, in many ways, but um, it's like, how can we repeat this culture elsewhere you know i actually just came up with a jubilee idea <laughs> what if you did <laughs> a blind not a, um kind of like a speed dating situation but but like dancing yes we've done <laughs> selecting a because from a dancer like watching but i don't we've never done it through like actual dancing together. actual that dancing that's super a, fun. yeah yeah yeah, I can help with the partner aspect of that. But anyway, just sorry. I just but like that that I would be really interested in seeing like like versus just a conversation. Right. People actually might connect through a dance. I like I totally feel that and I see that. But yeah. one question I've got for you is like as things are opening up, mm -hmm. what are ways for people to get involved? Like do you do classes or are you open to the public or is it more we get to watch performances or So, I do have right now I'm Right now, we're kind of in this transition period. Um, in terms of, uh, so we have, you know, we're a professional dance company, so we go out and perform and speak and, and things like that. You know, we do have a weekly youth class, um, but in terms of regular classes, that's kind of the bulk of it. But pre-pandemic, I would say every four months or so, we would do like one community something. So that was the flash mob was one. And what we did right before the pandemic was also a flash mob in collaboration with Adidas. And so I feel like post pandemic, it's like what I have in mind is let's have a solidarity flash mob. Oh yeah, people are ready. Everyone coming together. Cause I mean, it's like, I mean, how much do we hear of the word solidarity tossed around? Black and Asian solidarity, this and that solidarity. I mean, we hear that word tossed around a lot. There's a lot of talk. But in order to create change, change can't stay in our brains. It's got to like, it's like, it's got to be like full body expression, mm -hmm. like to create change. And that's why dance is so powerful, is that you know, in order to create change, you got to take that idea, 
you know, out of your head and somehow into your body and express it in whatever way. And so I feel like dance is like a really great bridge to make that happen. So my vision right now, and maybe you can help me out with this because <laughs> you're local and I know that you're going to the UK, but anyways, but anyways, but like it might be really interesting. Like I just feel like people are ready to just somehow connect physically, you know, and I, I, I think that we've been, I think I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm hoping that more people are more in tune with some of the social justice issues that are present, you know, and I feel like the pandemic has brought that up to the surface, but now it's like, hey, let's take all this information we learned and actually apply it. But a lot of people are like, well, what am I supposed to do? But I feel like dancing can be that bridge for people to, first of all, let their, let they express themselves connect with each other and be like, okay, now I'm ready to actually take action on whatever that is. Because not everyone, like my gift is dance and everybody has a gift on how they can create change. So, but I feel like dance can be that great bridge to get someone to take action. That'd be so much fun. We'd yeah. love to be part of And little known fact, but Louis is actually a great DJ as well. Oh. So he can DJ. Yes. <laughs> and I know they've done that. DJing. Enjoy DJing. <laughs> The silent discos and stuff but like that. I would as well. say where we need help the most is, um, and I and I told Brandon this is like, it's like visibility in the community. Like I've gained some support from some of the big brands, some high end media, but because what I have, you know, what I realized, and I know that we we've, we've talked a lot about is like what we're doing is kind of like five steps ahead of where everyone's at. So getting everyone to come to us has been like it's been kind of like this push but i feel like we're finally there where people are ready to actually physically connect and dance because there's a reason and a purpose you know so where we need help is just like what you all are doing like building community and just getting more people to be involved with us right yeah <laughs> but not even knowing about it and speaking about it yeah. really being involved like the fact that you guys came in and dance with us is where you will get that experience it's a mm. ripple yeah and we and we know like i got paralyzed when i was 15 so i spent 15 years walking and i knew what that fear was when i would see somebody with a with a wheelchair or a disability because i didn't know that world and i was afraid i was going to say something wrong mm. do something wrong make a fool of myself or not you know engage in the right way and so that uh, the world has a lot of that fear because they're not exposed to it. So it, you yeah. have to get exposed, but also in such a, an intimate way. Yeah. And dance is that that conduit. And and you know, me is right now talking about wheelchair disability, but this is not just disability for right. disability. This is for race. This Everything. is for like sexual orientation. I mean, I had this dream once, and when it's President Obama and and um, <laughs> Trump had a dance together. <laughs> and I mean, as cheesy and wow. corny and- That would go viral. Yeah, yeah, but like, if you think about it, or like, what if like they're, they're, they're you know, they, they like, let's say their wives and then like switch partners and they dance with, I mean, I don't know, but like, I'm just wondering if there would be any like aha moments in that, but it's, it's like, it's kind of like that. It, it, it's not dance, and it, we're do, we have a focus in disability inclusion, but intersectionality is kind of like where it's right. spreading. We focus on um, the common. The common yeah. is, is that we can all dance. Exactly. So that's, that's the focus. Once you focus on that, everything mm. else mm -hmm. is secondary. And that's mm. just part of who you are. It's just like when you see someone on the street, you're like, okay, they may be different. Of course, they're going to be different from you. We all have different fingerprints for a reason. We're different. But once you start talking to them, you realize, wait, we're human beings. We're, right. We have something in common. Let's focus on that. And the rest is just getting to know the person better. <laughs> but dance can be that yeah. first, that first yeah. introduction. I love that. Well, thanks for sharing. I feel like we're out of time, but um, where can people find out more? Like, what's your website and Instagram and stuff like that? Uh, you can find us at, at Infinite Flow Dance. Um, if you want to tag me, we're at Marissa Hamamoto, uh, infiniteflowdance.org. Sorry, I almost forgot our website. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, at Infinite Flow Dance, infiniteflowdance.org, Marissa Hamamoto, Mia Shaikowitz. Lord is Mac, <laughs> so, and, and I will yeah. send, yes, and Scoops of Inclusion is our film that we produced, um, 
during, and so these are kind of, I, I brought this poster because this has like our kind of core family all like on that poster. <laughs> you know, so. And that's well, the one thing about Marissa, she has created a, not only a community, but a, a family. And we really do feel that connection. And I do believe it's because not only of her vision, but because of the mission of making dance that connector. And it's, it is, it's gone viral in my opinion, <laughs> just because. It is. It's become viral. It's contagious. Mm. You know, that, that connection. Everyone wants to connect with everybody else. You oh, know? Yeah, it's like beautiful. When we when I first got here and I saw Mia, it was like, Oh my god, I haven't seen you in what, two years? Yeah. And it was so crazy. It was like I was seeing like a uh, an old family member. I was like, Hi, oh my god because we <laughs> hadn't gotten vaccinated. It was like, ah. Yeah, so thanks for having us today. Thanks for giving us this amazing experience and and I'm excited when you guys do your next big event and I'd love to come along and we will be there. Be a part of it. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. having us. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you, yay! Awesome thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Obviously that was a bit of a different experience. Like that was cool. Out what that was Morris is doing and super fun. Yeah. <laughs> See you guys. Bye. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for introducing me to them. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really cool what you're saying about like seeing. It's kind of what we were talking about on the way here. It was seeing this prejudice division happening. Um, but then she's like, "How do we paint a picture of what the future could look like, where we we are fully inclusive and we live in a society where we are yeah. metaphorically all dancing together, you know, or or at, you know." literally dancing together. I think dance is such a good like metaphor but also a good tool to do that. Yeah. Because she's right that like you don't have to say anything or you don't even have to communicate in a certain way. But you have to trust each other. Yeah. And it's the physical contact. I think there's something about like yeah. holding someone's hands where you're like <laughs> Yeah. It's very hard to dehumanize somebody when Oh you're, yeah it's so intimate. And, and when she's talking about looking in the eyes. Yeah. Yeah the first like ten minutes I was just looking <laughs> at my shoes but I was like, oh yeah right. I gotta how do I do this? Yeah. Something that we're going to relearn really too as we come out of the pandemic is like how do we, you know, like connect with strangers and like interact and mm. and rehumanize as well. Yeah, because there's, there's for years, over a year now, there's been so much fear around other people and the danger of contracting this <laughs> contagious thing. It's like, totally. how do we get back to, yeah, like interacting feeling comfortable at big social events. I think a lot, it's funny because a lot of my YouTube friends are actually, even though they come across as very extroverted online, are massive introverts and they've mm. almost enjoyed not yes. seeing people. And there's Whereas no I'm, FOMO. Yeah, but I'm kind of the opposite where I think I am. When I'm in a healthy place, I really am like an extrovert. I think when I'm exhausted, I, I do intro, go introverted, but, uh, yeah, I, enjoy, I love meeting new people. I, love, I agree. You know, just having that, like, there's this book I've read recently called um, The Serendipitous Mindset. Mm -hmm. And it's around how, like, we're constantly surrounded with these potentially life-changing op opportunities and things hap that could happen to us throughout the day. And it's like just keeping your eyes open for those moments where it could be like a sparking a conversation with someone new or um you know just going out of your way or you've kind of followed that kind of rather than being so blinkered in in what you're doing and yeah it talks about like um luck and how like some people view themselves as lucky because all these things happen to them yes uh, I, I totally believe that yeah. i love that mentality of how much just purely based on our mindset and our perspective like the same interactions or the same opportunities might look very different to different people. Um, yeah, so I love that. Um, I loved how she painted this picture of imagining uh, Trump and Melina and, <laughs> and Barack Obama and um, Michelle like dancing together and swapping partners. And I was like, in my head, I was kind of like, that's literally never going to happen. <laughs> that painted a very vivid picture. But I like the. I like the imagination to just think, but what if? Like, yeah. what if that kind of thing, that could change everything, you know? Right. Right. Um, do you, have you found it, because obviously you made a lot of videos, we were talking on the way here about like middle, the middle ground and like 
people with very different perspectives. Have you found moments where it's been really tough to uh, to invite people into that scenario, or are people always super willing to? to oh to, to yeah, talk? Um, absolutely. I think that our casting, you know, producers and the folks on our casting team have the most difficult jobs because they're looking. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we're looking for such obscure points of view sometimes mm. it feels like or really difficult to find points of view like when you're trying to get police officers and former you know convicted felons in a room together how do you even go about doing that right so it's such a challenging thing and not only that even when you find them there's office often a resistance to sharing your story because there's a distrust right like what yeah. if they manipulate what I say what if um, you know, they've got like ulterior motives. And I think in general, and I, I, some people don't, but I, I definitely, I don't know if I would say I avoid conflict, but it's not comfortable. Like knowing that something you say is going to spark some co level of conflict. It's right. like, right. I think the peacemaker in me is like always like, well, let's just, you know, let's just try and keep everyone happy. But totally. in a scenario where you've got, I mean, one of my friends said he was on one of the episodes as a school shooting survivor wow. and it was with N our NRA members. Yeah. I haven't watched that episode yet, but I was like, whoa, was that like really intense? And he's like, I think he was saying like, the conversation re didn't get heated because maybe they didn't really dive into like it. I don't know. It's so funny because, I mean, one thing is the content that we make is unscripted, obviously, right? Mm. So when we get criticism sometimes about like, why wasn't this perspective shared or why didn't you talk about this thing? Sometimes it's that we can't force anyone to talk about anything and we yeah. can't say, talk about this or what about that? Um, and we allow people to do it. But one thing that I'm really proud of is by and large, everyone either has like a neutral experience and they're like, that was interesting. I'm happy, that was interesting, I did that. Or majority of people actually leave saying, wow, that was really powerful for me. Not that my point of view changed, and that's not actually the point of empathy. I think it's important to remember that empathy is not about agreement, but it's about understanding. Mm -hmm. You and I may not agree on everything, but I might at least understand why you've come to that point of view. Yeah. And it could have, it could long-term spark a series of thoughts in somebody which holds prejudice or totally. holds a stubborn point of view that suddenly becomes, oh, actually, it's almost like pulling a thread and it's, Yes. starts kind of unraveling their viewpoint or their misconceptions or whatever. Totally. I, I think that empathy is like the pillar or like empathy is really the opposite of prejudice. Yeah. And the reason is because when you are looking eye to eye with someone, when you're dancing with someone, it's really hard to dehumanize them. It's really hard mm. to hate them, you know, in the way that sometimes we'll make blanket statements where I hate all X or Y or Z. Mm. It's really hard to do that when you know someone's name, you know, and someone's face and their story, so. That's something for me that I really found life transforming from traveling. Mm. Uh, Trevor Noah has, I mean, I heard, I don't know if it's his quote, but I remember him saying in a show once that travel is the antidote to ignorance. Oh yeah. And like meeting people from all around the world, different races, ethnicities, you know, ju just c completely different cultures to mine, made me realize, wow, like I've grown up with a very particular, kind of view on the world that isn't necessarily you know it's one of many completely different views and completely different experiences and then you suddenly start seeing how other people live and what what makes their world tick you know every you just see totally. and also you see the the common connection between everyone yes of that we are actually all very similar no matter where we're from we all want to you know be loved we all want to feel fulfilled and happy we want to protect our families you know there's all of these common traits yeah we actually want the same thing yeah it's funny i'm from the midwest so there's a lot of obviously more conservative folks there i know folks who are maybe anti even like the lgbt community mm. and it's really interesting because when i speak to them about those issues and that community it often almost feels like they're talking about like an alien species yes yeah. We're like, no, they are different, no. And it's very clear to me that there's not an individual or actual names or faces that they're talking about. They're yeah. talking about a group of whatever, right? And actually when I see, you know, uh, folks who have come out, you know, from the Midwest or you're like 
oh my gosh, this person's part of that community. It starts to really change the way people think because they're like, wait a second, but Louie, I love Louie. You know, and then you're like, oh, maybe that's not the way that I should kind of bucket think about all of these groups of people. And that's constantly happening, right? I think, you know, it's just the lazy human nature that we have is sometimes you will meet one individual or you will stereotype entire group of folks based on one maybe negative interaction even or positive. Um, and that's such an important thing for us to remember is that all these groups are so diverse, right? And that we are far more similar than we might think. Something I've realized whilst I've been on this road trip around the US and going into some of these small towns in America in the middle of nowhere is maybe their only perception of people from, of different races or just different beliefs is what the representation they see on TV shows. Yes. And I think it's getting better and I think mainstream media and Hollywood are kind of slowly getting better representation but even in even in for the Asian community, I know like it's been really slow, and there's not. It's only been until like the last couple of years where I've watched movies where the main, main characters are Asian. Do you know what I mean? Or the oh, heroes yeah, are Asian. Absolutely. And, and not having that, and only seeing these perpetuated stereotypes of like, oh, black people are criminals, or whatever it is that a lot of these, you know, for the last few decades of Hollywood, yeah. and that's where there's this prejudice formed. They might not know anyone of different ethnicities from only from what they see on TV, and then it's like, and and you realise they're not never meeting anyone new. They're you know, yes. they're only seeing they the same group, small group of people they grew up with. So I kind of understand a bit. I'm like, oh, you just haven't, and that's why I think cities where you're surrounded by different people is seem to be more progressive and liberal because you're you're interacting with a lot of different perspectives. Yeah. But yeah, I think growing up, I mean, representation is such a big issue for our community because. Growing up, when I was growing up, literally all we had was like Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan. Mm. And or in Hollywood movies, it's the Asian kids were always the geeky kids right. that weren't really popular. Exactly. And even From so, I those remember. were such few roles too. Yeah. So anytime anyone came up to me, they once either asked me like, hey, can you do martial arts? Are you related to Bruce Lee? Or like all these like random things. And I, me growing up, you know, I was born in America. I was like, wait a second. I just love football. I love all these other things. Yeah. And it, at first it didn't, I didn't understand it because I was like, wait, why are people thinking of me only in this way? And I started to recognize, oh, it's because it's only, we've only been depicted in one of like two or three different ways. Yeah. And you haven't seen like a fully developed Asian American character who is not one of those things you know almost ever so now we're super excited as we're seeing a lot more representation and even so we've got a lot of work to do yeah but um i'm really proud of you know and i think in a lot of ways uh spaces like youtube have actually been really good for minorities right yeah. where it's like there are no gatekeepers here who are going to tell us who's going to become the next brad pitt because people are just individually creating and that's why you initially saw so many like great Asian American YouTubers, right? Like the Ryan Higas and the Kev Jumbas and David Choi's of the world. Um, so I think that there is change coming and you know, we're just demanding that it comes faster. <laughs> yeah. And then she was saying, and obviously I'm, I know this is personal to you as well, but she was saying she's really passionate about the kind of stop Asian hate yeah. stuff that's happening right now what's your I guess firstly for people that don't fully understand in the same way that like last year a lot of people were only just learning about Black Lives Matter and what yeah. the true causes are about how it's so much more than you know one killing it's it's much deeper than that for people that don't fully understand the Asian hate that's happening right now especially the last year or so you know since the pandemic what's your could you summarize what's going on and then maybe we could totally just talk about like solutions or how we can be how I can be a support as an ally totally I mean I think obviously we're, we're battling one of the worst pandemics ever and early on in the pandemic former President Trump would use language like the Wuhan flu right the Wuhan flu or the Chinese virus and the reason why that was so painful was because you were essentially kind of like targeting a group of individuals for a pandemic that was not necessarily uh, that they're not responsible for right 
and especially as we think now from an Asian American perspective, there are over 20 different ethnicities in America that are represented by the Asian American community. So for example, I'm Korean. Yeah. I'm Korean American. There's Japanese American, there's Filipino, there's Vietnamese. And we're like a pretty diverse group. And suddenly, Asian Americans were being attacked for a pandemic that we had no hand in, right? Uh, even Chinese Americans, there's no reason why Chinese Americans, you know, there's no reason to attack them because of uh, the pandemic. Yeah. But what we've seen in the last year was a exponential rise in Asian, anti-Asian attacks. And it primarily started with our elderly. So grandmothers, grandfathers, literally walking on the street who would be beaten to death purely because of the fact that they're Asian. And this has kind of sparked an outcry where we say, first off, we're not going to allow our elderly to be attacked this way. But also, we've got to remember and recognize that there is racism that is happening here and we're going to fight up against it, right? And I think it, it is very much coming on the back of the Black Lives Matter movement where we're saying, you know what, what we want to do is we want to dismantle systemic racism and the injustice that we see. And of course, the racism that the Asian American community is facing is very different than the one that the black community is facing. But still, there are a lot of similarities as to um, the structure by which it was all kind of created. So that was like a pretty heady answer, except for to say that um, we're seeing a lot of anti-Asian sentiment, but also now we're seeing a lot of Asian Americans standing up and saying, hey, enough is enough and we're not going to allow this to stand. Let's stop Asian hate. Yeah, and ideally, and this is where I want to be a support, is like it shouldn't just be Asian Americans standing up saying it's not okay for elderly Asian Americans to be beat to death, beaten to death. Like that should be something that's, you know, we yeah. should all be standing up against in solidarity and saying, totally, what, you know, whatever's brought us to this point, we have to start, we have to dismantle this, the lies, the the prejudice the stereotypes, has been built up, yeah. the stereotypes, everything needs to be. And I can't, it's interesting because I just can't wrap my head around it, but that's still no excuse to, like part of me, I was like, I just don't understand like where, how this has got so extreme. Yeah. But I want to learn, I want to understand, okay, am I, am I like, sub, am I, unconsciously contributing to a toxic environment or you know microaggressions towards Asian Americans or anything like I kind of want to figure out where how do we start holding ourselves accountable for even the small things and then figuring out okay how do we start dismantling or creating you know figuring out solutions and one of them might be yeah like fight you know really pushing for better representation that's certainly part of it not you know, allowing the systems that currently are exclusive or you know it's all white men that are like calling the shots and deciding the yeah you know <laughs> I, think, I think that's definitely part of it you know the two of the things I would point to that are that I think that a lot of uh, Americans and a lot of folks who are not Asian have to familiar, familiarize themselves with is one is this kind of perpetual foreigner syndrome mm. which is when I was growing up again I was born in America I grew up in Kansas the question I would always get asked where is, from? where are you from? Yeah. And I didn't understand it because I was like, what do you mean? I'm from 135th and Antioch. I, I'm from down the street. And they would say, no, where are you really from? And it took me so long to recognize, wait a second. Oh, you don't see me as an American. You see me as something else. And that is different than kind of wanting to appreciate someone's ethnicity, right? But when you ask it in that way, you are implying that you don't belong here, actually. So these are like microaggressions that we're perpetuating by saying, oh yeah, you're Chinese, right? Or like, oh yeah, where are you really from? Or I love Vietnamese food, you love Vietnamese food too, right? And it's like, no, actually, you know, Asian Americans are a pretty diverse set of communities. And not only that, as Americans, we see ourselves as Americans, we belong here, right? And that's, if you're really interested in maybe someone's heritage or their background, like a better way to ask that or more considerate way to ask that is even like, what is your ethnicity, right? Yeah. Or, or what's your heritage? Or what is your heritage, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's like me seeing, you know, my friend John, who's also from Kansas, but you know, white, brunette hair, blue eyes, and saying, where are you really from? There's no, 
that kind of is such a preposterous question to even kind of like conceive of, right? So that's, I think, an idea that we've got to like dismantle a bit just because the first Asian immigrants came literally hundreds of years ago. Yeah. Like the Chinese immigrants first came and they were like building a railroad. Like yeah. that same, same time as all the European immigrants. Were in fact, before several European immigrants, which is really interesting, right? The second idea that is also a myth that is often perpetuated is this model. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you too. He did. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, is this idea of the model minority. And the idea of the model minority was actually constructed by the New York Times, actually. So a very, like, uh, very white idea, actually. But it was look at all these Asian Americans or look at all these Asians and look how successful they are. If, look how much they've like really um, succeeded in America and they would look at other minorities and say why aren't you more like Asians so they would look at the black community or Latino community or Native American community and say if only you worked as hard as Asians you would be more successful so on one hand you're kind of like well that seems like maybe a good thing um, the reason why it's not a good thing is because actually a large 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 percentage of our community like over a fourth of our community in New York City is like below the poverty line and really, really impoverished actually. And because of language barriers, it's actually really difficult for Asian Americans or Asians to like succeed in America. So that's a myth in and of itself that all the Asians are successful. It's just that they've chosen a couple of select individuals and saying, look how great they are. But secondly, what, what's happening is they're pitting minority groups against each other to say why black people, why Hispanic people, why you know why aren't you as good as this? And it's creating animosity now too. So those are just two things that I would just share as like these are myths that we have to like dismantle initially. And when you start to understand how harmful those can be, um, then we can start to think about some of the ways we can rectify it. Right. Um, some of the conversations I've been having with other creators as well is like, okay, how do we? And again, going back to, I feel like you've, uh, the person I look up to the most in terms of how you've, at you and your team have like looked at storytelling. But, you know, a lot of creators I talk to is like, okay, we care about these issues. How do we communicate this to our audience? How do we figure out ways to storytell around this? Have you got any upcoming videos or stuff that you have released around Stop Asian Hate, which tackles kind of some of the nuances of it? Is that something you guys yeah. are, like trying no, to do? No, it's a great question. You know, one thing that we're really proud of is that if you look at just the history of our videos, mm. we've got all these videos that actually speak exactly to this point now. So for example, we did a Spectrum. Spectrum is the one where we kind of get like six oh, people. Yeah. Do all- I think I've seen, I think I've seen you that know, Do all Americans think the same or do all frat boys think the same? And of yeah. course the answer is no, but we want to like demonstrate that we're not a monolith, right? Yeah. And we have a great one that says, do all Asian Americans think the same? And it kind of demonstrates just like how rich the diversity within the Asian American community is. Um, so there are a lot of videos that we would definitely kind of promote and say, and actually during this month, for every view on these videos that we have in this playlist, we're actually contributing also to a great organization called um, the Asian American Pacific Islander Kind of Action Fund. Okay. Um, so simply by watching those videos, you're supporting the cause, which is really fun for us. But I think a lot of it, you often hear the, the word like, you know, you got to do the work, right? And yeah. I, I have a lot of friends say, Jason, I don't know what that means or how do I do the work? And what I'll say is that part of it is doing the work within your community. So if you are, let's say that you're white, right? And that you're starting to become aware of like, man, I don't think I want to stop Asian hate when you see other folks within your community who are exhibiting some of these racist behaviors or even ignorance to kind of gently or if necessary forcefully kind of say hey that's not okay and in the same way every community has to do it within their own community i think that's what i think doing a lot of the work is because it's hard for me to come into another community and say hey do this in the same way it's hard for like you know a black person or a white person to come to a group of asians and say hey you better think this way it's, that's what a, a true allyship looks like. And that's why I love, you know, I heard someone once say, like, I think of ally not as a noun. Of course, you're an ally and that's a noun, but really, I like ally as a verb. 
like it means that you are doing that work of standing in the gap often for other folks um, so that's the first thing I would say and the second thing is being open-minded to hearing different perspectives and points of view and really hearing that some of the pain that people are struggling with is really real right I know initially when there's a group that you're not as familiar with saying, hey, this is a really big issue, you're like, no, it's not really a problem that pertains to me. But what empathy looks like is actually being able to understand truly the feelings of someone else, even though you don't even have those shared experiences. Um, and I think that we're all as humans, really, we're all capable of that. That's like a uniquely human characteristic is that we're able to show empathy. So I think that's the other thing. It's just trying to like to open up and let the, the guard down and recognize that sometimes that will like brush up against us because it makes us, I've felt this way before. Where I'm like, wait a second. I think I've stereotyped someone. I've actually prejudiced someone. I think I've actually been racist to someone in the past. Whoa, how do I dismantle that? And recognizing that just because that's happened doesn't make you a bad person per se, it's only once you recognize that what you're gonna do about it that really dictates who you are. And the reason I say that is because so much of who, the way we think about these things are a reflection of representation, the media, and our education. And both of those things are historically very, very much built on like a system of what people will call white supremacy, right? Yeah. And again, white supremacy is not saying all oh, white people are bad. It just means that the system that was built had a hierarchy in which like certain or white was at the top and maybe like others were at the bottom and how do we dismantle some of those things we're getting really deep into this but no this is great <laughs> what i love about what marissa's been doing yeah is that it's saying okay how do we start interacting more with people that we don't wouldn't typically hang out with and i've yeah. noticed a lot that and this is probably just human nature that we will tend to stick with people that look like us and we connect to in some way some you know some something that we we totally. find a common yeah common ground with yep. and that hinders us really integrating with a bunch of you know typically i think you know some people might have grown up in the friendship groups that are very very multiracial multicultural totally i didn't i grew up in a very white area and it wasn't until i moved into london where the area i lived in was way more mixed that I was like oh wow like I've just had such a white friendship group my most of my life totally um, but I love that there's things like dance or other I mean I'm sure there's other connection points where you could be like hey you know let's there's no there's no like this this doesn't specify where where you're from your heritage your sexual orientation like I love that that was her vision for it it's like everyone's together you know that's so good and I think there's other settings that allow that and maybe that's part of one of the steps of action is look for and especially now we're things are slowly opening up again to be more you know where we could actually be in person with people but like look for events or clubs or scenarios where you're deliberately create you know able to create friends with dif from different ethnicities I think one thing we can absolutely I think one thing we can take away from like the dancing experience is like you know initially there was some discomfort right of mm. like oh this is gonna be awkward this is gonna be weird mm. I think that that's actually an important ingredient in our life that so often of course we would love to live a life of comfort where there's no friction there's no difficulty but that's actually demonstrates that we're not growing as individuals sometimes and we're not evolving right and one thing that's really important is that when we are very different and we're in interacting with perspectives that we're not familiar with, initially it can feel actually uncomfortable or kind of jarring, but I actually think that it ends up being a more rich or fulfilling experience in some ways because we're not just taking like what is the most basic connecting component of it. Oh, you and I are both male, oh, therefore we have this in common. It's like you, you know, this guy and me are both Asian, therefore we have this in common, but you start to get into much more interesting kind of conversations and like a lot more overlap in that way, so. Another layer to, to it as well for me, which I've thought about a lot is 
how do you move beyond the potential of it being like a tokenism thing where like you've got oh that token Asian friend or token black friend um, which I think I don't know I'm, I'm just interested from different perspectives sometimes of it I know some people have felt like that yeah. if there's been scenarios where you're trying to diversify your friendship group but then it's like you you It'd get be the weird one. if you're only inviting one friend. It's <laughs> yeah. like, oh, let's. I even heard some. I mean, kind of throwing David Dobrik under the bus here, but there was like, there was some backlash a few months ago, and I don't know how much of it was joking or whatever. But that, and this ties into cancel culture. But they were joking one of the podcasts about how they didn't have an Asian friend in their friendship group, mm. and they were looking for an Asian friend, and they, and it was just like it felt very like this tokenism thing of like well that's just not how things work and like yeah. and I get I get that's how often like brands and commercials often think of like all oh, we need for this campaign to show this diverse that we've got like representation but then it's like yes that's great but then how how does it become like just a natural thing rather than it feeling like forced if you know what I mean I do know what you mean uh, it's a really good question. Kind of a tough. It is a. It's a tough. No, it's a. It's a good one. And I. And let me just say that with all of these things, I don't know. You know, I don't yeah. feel like I've got the answer, but I do certainly have like perspective on it. Yeah. One is. Um, there are so many times when I actually encounter someone who I wouldn't even call them racist. I would call them like maybe a little bit ignorant or like I, you know, if I were ever to say something, I would maybe gently correct someone, mm-hmm. where people will say how dare you say that I have a friend that is Asian or I have a friend that is black right and we use that as like okay if we have that one friend and therefore that means that I cannot do any wrong to this entire group or this community and if we just think about that just like on its face it's like me saying oh I can't be misogynistic because I have a friend who's a girl yeah. uh, that, that's not true right yeah. and so so we have just got to recognize that that can't be true and then the second thing is like I think the question of like what does it mean to be a friend is really important too like if you're simply being a friend to me because i checked this box of ethnicity like i would argue that maybe we are not friends then, yeah. right that that's a good yeah that and sometimes that there are relationships like this which is like i need someone that i can be learning from about the asian american community but then that's like more of a um what is it called not bartering but like you know it's like a conditional conditional yeah. exactly um, so I think it's about like doing life um, and I think that you kind of know when you're being used as a token versus like you are part of a community or at least that you are kind of speaking to each other in a certain way that like engenders trust but that's a really good question <laughs> um, I'd love to get a bit more personal as well sure. I know you've recently got married we did um i'd love to hear a bit about like that journey because i feel like i'm on that same journey right now like got engaged at the beginning of the year congratulations and we're just learning um we're just learning a bit about how to do life together and we've recently kind of started seeing our finances as as a single you know that we have a singular finance that we share together which is so new for me and just starting to build a life together it's a very different way of operating i don't know i'd just love to hear a bit of your story really and like yeah um because you you were also doing a long distance for a while right? we were yeah so my story was that uh i was single obviously i was single before i met mel um i uh in 2016 i was on facebook and i was served like a facebook ad yeah and it was a video of this reporter doing an interview of a, like a CEO of like this really impressive company. I forget which one it was. And it kind of pans back to a reporter. And I was like, wow, this reporter is like really smart and really pretty. And that's just what I thought. I was like, huh, that's really interesting. So I clicked in and I was like listening to it. And the way that the Facebook algorithm works, I think, is that because I had clicked into it every day that week, I kept on getting fed, the same fed the same thing. And I was like, man, this is a sign from God or the universe. <laughs> and of course, her name kind of pops up. It's like, oh, Melody Ham, Yahoo Finance. So I Google her, of course, and I found her. And I'm like, oh, my God, she's like Korean-American. 
and she seemed like super witty. She like loved hip hop music and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, I'm just gonna reach out on Twitter and say, hey, big fan of your work, right? Not creepy, just like kudos, you're doing a great job. I love that confidence though, because a lot of people <laughs> wouldn't do that. I love yeah, that. This was public, by the way. This wasn't me in the DM. I said, hey, big fan of your work, keep up the good work. And she actually responded in kind and she said, hey, it looks like you're doing something really cool at Jubilee. Great to connect. And it kind of was that. Yeah. It was like this, you know, you've got that LinkedIn friendship. Professional, yeah. Yeah, we're rooting for each other as just Korean Americans or as just like young people. And then, um, and then I also saw that she was in New York. Um, I used to live in New York and I have a lot of friends in New York. And uh, about a half a year later, I was actually going to New York for a wedding. And suddenly in my mind, it popped up. I was like, oh, that awesome journalist, Melody, lives there. So at that point, I was like, you know what? I kind of want to just like, I would love to grab coffee with her just to see what she's like or what she's up to. See if there's some chemistry. Yeah, and definitely in my mind was, uh, she's really attractive. Um, so I asked her for coffee. I sent her a DM. I said, hey, would you want to grab coffee? And she said, you know, I'm actually traveling, but I'm flying back in the night before you're flying out if you want to grab drinks. Oh, and I said, do you want to grab drinks? And she said, yeah. And I was like, oh. And she'll tell you this story completely differently because I was like, oh, we're going to have like drinks, kind of a date. And she was like, oh, I almost canceled. I was like, why am I meeting up with this random dude for drinks? And we met up and we just like hit it off. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but it was like we could just, it felt like we knew each other and we talked the entire evening. Like we closed out the bar at 4 a.m., went to another bar, then ended up just walking around Central Park for the rest of the night until I had to fly out. Well, the I also had my first connection in New York. That was where I met Raya and going, okay. we walked around New York and had a similar evening. Where It's, it's a like, magical yeah. city because everything is open for so long and it's not weird to be like, do you want to go to another bar or like, do you want to keep hanging out, you know? Um, so then of course by then I'm like, this is it. I, this is the girl. And I'm a, I'm a romantic. Oh wow, one night is all it took. Or I, it wasn't like I'm gonna marry her, but it was, that was unlike a connection I've ever kind of really encountered. Yeah. So that was like desperately trying to find a way to go back to New York. So I, I made up an excuse actually to fly to New York oh, for a week try to hang out with her she was like super busy not trying to hang out finally we had a date that went well and we ended up seeing each other like the entire week by the end of the week i was like okay i want to i want to date this girl um so i asked her on a date she actually said no <laughs> oh wow she said no a couple of times and then several months later because she was like you live in la this is nonsensical this makes no sense yeah. several months later uh she went to a drake concert and uh, I think she had a couple of too many drinks and called me up and was like, hey, I think I want to date now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we started dating, thanks wow. to, to Druzy. So that was the beginning of the journey. Um, I watched your video with her where you, it was like both sides. Yes. And something that really intrigued me was that her father wasn't, didn't approve initially. He did not. And I don't know why, but I just wanted to ask you about it because it's like that would be like devastating for any guy looking to marry a girl to not have the father's approval. Um, I don't know how I would have reacted in that scenario. I'd have felt so like defeated. Because Heartbroken, yeah. Because even if you're like, well, I'm going to go ahead anyway, to not have that kind of the the blessing, the support, yeah. would be so tough. I'd, so what what kind of transpired? I'd love to hear like how you, did you, <laughs> did it, did it resolve? Like, did you manage to win him over and stuff? Like, or is it an ongoing thing? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, Mel is the only child and her father is a conductor. So he's like a maestro. Okay. And uh, so he's, uh, I think maestros are known to be very temperamental and very like kind of hot headed, but he is, he really fulfills that kind of archetype, I would say. Wow. Um, and when I first kind of met him, he was like really cordial to me, he was fine, but it was actually when we were getting really serious and I knew that I wanted to ask for her hand, I wanted to do it in a way that was really traditional and like, you know, get the blessing. Respecting the pair. Of course. Like, yeah. And he said no, and I was shocked. And the reason I was shocked, honestly, is because, and this is not to toot my own horn, but I've always been the kid, whether it's at church or friends, parents know me, I've always been the kid that everyone's parents really like. 
where they're like, oh, you should hang out more with Jason. He's like a good kid. Or a girl. So you'd be the winning. You'd yeah, be like the winning I've guy. never had an issue. Like that is my core demographic, you know? <laughs> you and can win over the parents. I've always felt that. Even if like the daughter wouldn't like me, the parents would like me, right? Yeah. But with him, he was just like against it. And um, it actually became a whole thing. We actually went to her family, her cousin's wedding that Mel was a part of. And I ended up at lunch with her mom and her dad. Uh, very casually, we ended up at lunch together. We were supposed to be the whole family, but her aunt and her uncle dropped out because they had to do something for the wedding, blah, blah, blah. So it happened to just be the three of us. And I like really deliberately asked, like in Korean, practicing everything. And he said, no. And I said, oh my God, what? he goes, no. If you were gonna ask me, you should have like worn a suit and you should have like pulled out all the stops. Wow. So not only did he say no, later that day we ended up going uh, to the wedding together and he was driving us to the wedding, similar to this. And I knew by this point he was like super formal, right? Yeah. And on my way down to the hotel reception to, to leave with him, when I sat down, you know, we're supposed to meet at, let's say five o'clock. I sat down at like 4.55, I look at my suit and I have like a tiny little hole right at the seam of my pants. Oh no. And I'm freaking the F out because I'm like, dude, this guy's gonna see this. He's gonna flip out and be like, you're not good enough for my daughter. So I run to the front desk. I ask him if they have a sewing kit. Lo and behold, they do. So you're sewing your pants. So I run to my room, I'm sewing my pants. And then I get a call to my room, it's like 5.03 and they're like, where are you? And I'm like, shit, I'm late. Oh, now, now you've been disrespectful, you're yes. late. <laughs> So I run down, I get in the car, he goes, why were you late? And I'm, I'm making, I made up an excuse. I said, oh, sorry, I couldn't find my gift or my card. He goes, that's unacceptable, get out of my car. And I'm shocked. He and goes, you're like less than five minutes late. Oh yeah, yeah, within five minutes. And he oh said, that's so God. disrespectful, why would you be late? And I'm like, so then I said- You should have just been on it. So then I was honest, I said, I'm so sorry. I'm so embarrassed. I was early, but, I had a hole in my pants and I went to sew it up. And then um, he was pissed still, but he said, all right, fine. So we're on our way to the wedding. Oh my God. And we're on our way to the wedding. He's driving, my mother-in-law, my future mother-in-law is in the back seat. And I'm sitting here giving him directions, super awkward. And he's like progressively getting more and more angry. And he's like, that was so disrespectful. That shows me your character, that you're not a responsible person, that you're not gonna take care of my daughter. I don't like Whoa. this. I don't like you for my family and my family. This is unacceptable. And he kept on saying this and I was like shocked and I was like so hurt that he, you know, and I was embarrassed too because I was like, dude, I was late, but I feel like there was a good reason for it. And he kept on saying it to the point that I said, I said really respectfully, I said respectfully, and I said this in Korean, but respectfully, I, I'm so sorry I'm late, but in my family, like we wouldn't talk to each other this way. Yeah. You know, and as soon as I said that, we were on the highway. He pulled over. He said, "Get out of my car!" And he kicked me out of his car, and he left me on the side of the highway, and he drove off. Oh my gosh! And was your my girlfriend? My girlfriend was or? at the wedding. Oh, okay. Because I was so like, she's is not she in not intervening? I'm like, no, is she she's not, not like, there. She has no idea. Dad, shut up! Like, and she would have. Um, but I'm like on the side of the highway, and literally, I think to myself. Did you F. cry? I was crying. Oh yeah, I would oh, be crying I'm for sure. I'm falling because I'm like, I've ruined it. You I, thought that might be it, like I, she- Oh yeah, because I thought, oh my God, if I don't get her, her, yeah, and I know that their family is so close. I was like, oh, if he doesn't, and I don't want to be in a family where I don't want, you know, the father doesn't love me or at least accept me. And this so was I'm all crying. last year, this was happening? This was a year and a half ago. Wow. And I was like, I've messed this up, I've ruined it. I should have just kept my mouth shut, all that stuff. Um, I Uber, I ended up getting an Uber to the wedding, all of that. We, I talked to Mel and she, she's, she supported me because she's like, I understand, my, my father can be a really difficult person at times, right? And that became a whole thing that we had to like talk about. It was like, what is our family gonna look like? If you and I, you know, if we're gonna get married, is this, what are our values? What if, how are we going to interact with your father, etc.? And what does like honor and respect look like totally. in, in practical? Does it, you know, totally? Because like you were saying, you would never speak to your family like that, so right? Like... And I'm afraid now that like my family is going to look like that, right? And I talked a lot with my parents, and you know, at the end of the day, I said I love Mel, 
And the, it was such a good litmus test for me of like, am I willing to fight? Like the big, big, big boss yeah. for Mel, right? And I asked her mother and I said, I, I love Mel, I love your daughter, I'd love to marry her. And she said, you know what, you gotta, you gotta go for it then. So I said, okay, I think I've got the blessing. Oh. And, she, and she said, you know what you should do? You should reach out and send an email to her father. So the night before I proposed, I actually sent an email to her father that was not like, can I have permission? I said, I'm planning on proposing and I would love your blessing and I would love to be a part of this family, right? And I proposed and Mel said yes and it was this beautiful thing and actually we called her dad right after and we called her dad, it's such an interesting thing that happened when he got on the phone, he was so happy for her, his daughter huh. and he, he said to me, Jason, um, I'm sorry, this was just, I just wanted to protect my daughter and I wanted to make sure that she married someone who was great. Mm. And I'm like, <laughs> Uh, okay, this is great. And it's so funny because in the years since, you know, we're now obviously married, we, we have a great relationship where it's not, we're not best friends and, you know, it's not, it doesn't look like that, but I think we have a, like a mutual respect. Yeah. And um, I think I understand that for him, it's like he was trying to do what he thought was best for his daughter. And I think that sometimes the father's love just manifests in, in very different ways. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that's how we ended up. And now I'm happy to share, like our families are great and you know, we speak to him once a week and all that stuff. Well, <laughs> thanks for opening up about that. Like yeah. that honestly it's is a crazy an incredible story. story. Yeah. I just cannot imagine, like I, I felt like just listening to that was an emotional roller coaster because I was picturing myself in your position, just like knowing that I've had recently got engaged. Like I was just totally. like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, did that go? I mean, and I think I would have probably been like, screw your dad, like, be like very. I, I think eventually I would have just. I'm thinking I would have been like, well, this isn't his life, like. But right. then, like you said, that's not <laughs> that's not a good attitude because it's like I wouldn't want there to be a rift, right? Moving forward and that. In yeah, what do you picture? And how? What kind of relationship would you like to have with your future father? Yeah, right? and then when you have kids and stuff, like totally. you wouldn't want a rift whether you. You know, there's a rift from them to feel like there's not a good relationship between them and their, their grandparents. I don't know. So anyway, uh, wow, so, I, a lot of respect for like navigating through that because that's like one of those, like you said, almost like an it was out of the blue, like a sudden shocking spanner in the works, almost like it did. You just it, wouldn't expect that. But. It taught me a lot about myself, I mean, honestly. But how, I mean, how did it go for you when when you talked to him well, about his family I, or? I didn't specifically ask permission, but partly because I've al already felt like a total blessing. Yeah, yeah, like I already felt uh, very. That's awesome. Much that, like they approved of it, or and they were kind of waiting think, for it to happen. <laughs> yeah, we took a bit longer to get to that stage in our relationship, so I think uh, most people were like, "Oh, finally, like you're engaged," because we right. we've been together for six years now, so um, it's cool that we. Are finally moving into this next chapter and honestly I'm really excited and we're already talking about like having kids and yeah as, basically as soon as the wedding's over we're gonna start trying for kids because amazing why not you know we're not um, it's the first time in my life that I've been felt ready like I think in my through my whole 20s and most of my 30s I've been like oh kids like that's mm. gonna change everything but now I'm like well I'm going into a new chapter anyway because um, we're moving down to Costa Rica and yeah. I don't know I just I'm excited Dude, I'm I think so I'm excited, excited for, for you. New, the new chapter and I'm excited for your new chapter thank you I, I think one thing that's and she she's moved to LA right she lives in LA yep we so live. that was was that a tough choice for her to kind of leave her life in New York and yeah it uh, was and it was you know you're asking someone to like put their faith in you and yeah. our relationship and make a leap of faith. We weren't engaged at that point, right? We had never, and the reason was because everything had been delayed once yeah, all this yeah. happened. But um, I'm really grateful to her because I think, you know, people say behind every great like creator or founder is like an even more special kind of partner. Yeah. And I think Mel is that for me. She's the one who in so many ways helped me find the courage to, to start Jubilee Media actually and get through a lot of that, kind of that difficult time that I was mentioning. So just she to clarify, so Jubilee Media, 
yeah was basically you were just you kind of rebranded or it was more of a behind the scenes you re jiggled like how it was structured we or actually has the channel changed a lot since i created a new entity actually okay so jubilee project still exists as a 501c3 and then i created a new entity and we actually had to technically we had to buy the assets from Jubilee Project. Oh, okay. And now we consider Jubilee Project like the sister foundation or organization to Jubilee Media. And on, but from the front end perspective, the audience might not necessarily know. We made a big announcement, and that's actually when we switched. We switched a lot of the content from early on. We were doing a lot of like fictional, like uh -huh. scripted films, okay. short films. Blind Devotion was like a big film that people knew us for, and then all of this kind of unscripted, formatted space all came mainly with Jubilee Media. So middle ground, odd men out. I remember seeing that shift and being really impressed because it was like, in order to make impactful stuff, you need to play the game a little bit of yeah. like drawing an audience in, creating those ones where it's like one versus 50 yeah. blind dates or whatever, like real life Tinder, all those Savvy, kind of things. Yep. Like, and it's interesting I've just been inspired because it's like, yeah, you need to draw people in who aren't necessarily going to click on like the really intense, like yes. middle ground yes. issues, but they want to watch like 50 people get rejected. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the thing we, we, we talk about it internally as like, you know, chocolate covered broccoli. Broccoli, yeah, yeah. Um, um, Amar talks about that with his yes, the yes theory stuff as well. Exactly, exactly. And it's so necessary. And we actually think of it as like a, a funnel where, you know, on its face, the 50 versus one or a 20 versus one, you're just like, oh, this is just cringe. Yeah. This is a spectacle. In a lot of ways it is, but in, all, in a lot of ways, it also like puts a mirror to our society and humanity and our connections. And it's an entry point into start thinking about some of these bigger questions. So in a lot of ways, there's like a, a flow of how we want you to get into understanding or into being aware of Jubilee and slowly make your way into a lot of the more um, I wouldn't even call it more impactful stuff, but more on the nose empathy stuff. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Well, keep doing what you're doing, man. I just Appreciate honestly it, love the Jubilee channel. I'm so excited to see how you continue to like. Thank you. Kind of lead the way in, in social impact content on YouTube. And thank you, man. I feel like you you walked a walk, and you that you know you what is it? You walked the talk. Like I I feel like I've known you now for like at least half a decade, if not yeah, more. Yeah. But I've consistently seen you in this space, right? Like doing the work behind the scenes, you were doing so much of the work, even like the, during the Black Lives Matter movement, like having a lot of the calls, doing the education, connecting people, giving people opportunities and platforms. So, you know, that's one of the reasons when, when you kind of texted me, I was like, yeah, I am here at any time because I know that to your core, you're you're not only an ally, but you're doing you know such great work in the community and with your platform. So, oh, kudos thanks, to man. you, man. I appreciate, I appreciate. That. No, I really, really, uh, I'm really um, admire the work that you're doing. So, if there's a final thought that you could leave people with that are listening or watching, what what do you think that would be? Like, I don't know, some life advice or just a, a challenge or something to provoke people. What what would you leave them with? That's a good question. Putting you on the spot. No, it's a good one. There's so many things I would say. Um, I think the thing I would say is this. I think that despite all of our differences, we have far more in common than we might think. And that it's finding the similarities and the differences that we have is actually what makes for a much more kind of fulfilling, richer community and experience. And even though sometimes that feels uncomfortable, that I would lean into that discomfort. Mm -hmm. Seek discomfort, right? Yeah. That I would lean into even fear and failure because that often means that there's something much, much more powerful, much more um, rewarding on the other side of that journey. So to anyone who's kind of struggling or feeling like they're like, they don't have the direction or they feel like they're not doing a good enough job, I would just say know that a lot of times that, that means that the work is being done right now. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank well, you, brother. Thanks for coming. I appreciate on. you, man. And uh, yeah. Of course. Go and check out Jubilee's channel and everything yes. you're up to. Please like, subscribe, and we will see you soon.
Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Jubilee and Infinite Flow and subscribe to this podcast for future episodes. Please leave a comment suggesting future guests you'd love to see on the show.